opportunity to speak here today on this important topic. As a disclaimer, I would like to say this uh, lecture is on behalf of Zydus Pharma, uh, but a lot of these slides are scientific in nature. Uh, I, I want to re really talk something about MASLD because if you know that the entire nomenclature of fatty liver disease has taken a change from what we used to talk about NAFLD and now it's moved on to talking about MASLD and why this nomenclature has really come about through a Delphi consensus through multiple organizations. So if you look at the, uh, the incidence of fatty liver disease, India alone contributed about 18.3% liver related deaths and this is in sort of contradistinction to what the global patterns have been. And if you look at you know, United States, China and, uh, and if you look at the world statistics, India is perhaps a larger contributor to the liver related deaths than the other developed nations. And we have varied factors that are responsible, but one of the most important factors, as you see on the right side, is presence of NAFLD in the population, which is to the tune of almost about 40%. There are other reasons. The only thing that surpasses us is the alcohol drinking habit and alcoholic liver disease. But I'm sure that this incidence is really tough to estimate because we don't really get a total idea about what would be the alcohol related you know, fatty liver disease that we'd be looking at. But clearly we have about 40% of a population that has presence of NAFLD in some form or the other in some stage or the other. So this is really the elephant in the room and it needs to be addressed very seriously because it's a silent growing epidemic and you don't see what is happening to the patient because if you look at most of our ultrasound reports, they would get reported as grade one fatty liver. And I'm sure nine out of 10 uh, ultrasound reports would have that uh, line at the bottom that it's a grade one fatty liver. So the question that always comes to every clinician's mind is, what level of cognizance do we need to give to that report? And there should be markers which indicate that which are the fatty liver, you know, ultrasound detected should be taken seriously and investigated and followed up on so that we don't miss the bus on actually fatty liver disease that are going to lead to chronic liver disease. Uh, this is just a summary of how the statistics stand out. The worldwide statistics is about 25%. As I mentioned, India is about close to 40%. That's about 38 odd percent. 58% uh, of patients who have other metabolic disorders would have a coexisting uh, uh, fatty liver disease. But what is alarming is the fact that we have almost about 35% of our pediatric age group which has presence of fatty liver disease. Now this mirrors the incidence of childhood obesity that we've got and the two really go hand in hand and that's rather alarming that if you have 35% of your pediatric population that has fatty liver disease and these population unlawfully do aggressively something in form of you know weight reduction, their, their kind of dietary eating habits and all other sort of uh, factors that lead to fatty liver disease. These children are going to end up with early onset of chronic liver disease and that's something that's not really very uh, enterprising as such. This was another sort of paper which looked at about 1500 odd patients with diabetes and what it really showed off, I'm just going to skip the pie diagram, but I'm going to summarize in interest of time, that 75% prevalence of steatosis and 29% liver fibrosis are present in the study. Although the population studied is small, and this paper is by Vijay Panikar and his associates, which was uh, published in JAPI this year. But what stands out is it's not really uncommon. So although the population studied is small, but it gives the message that we need to look at our population, particularly patients with diabetes. And I'm going to talk about why diabetes in the next couple of slides, that it's not really uncommon and we need to screen our patients for steatosis and liver fibrosis. So here's the reason why perhaps, you know, fatty liver diseases now changes nomenclature, because we feel that the presence of fatty liver disease comes with a host of other metabolic abnormalities or which sort of stand out as cardiovascular risk factors. So if you see obesity, almost 90% would tend to have NAFLD. Uh, 
Type 2 diabetes, almost 70% would tend to have NAFLD, and hypertension, 68%, high triglycerides, almost 80%, and as a conglomeration of metabolic syndrome, 70% of patients would tend to have NAFLD. So if you see this across the board, most of the non-communicable diseases have a very high incidence of association with NAFLD. And that stands to reason because when the, the, the consensus was made, they, one of the reasons why it was changed other than you know the association with metabolic risk factors was they felt that the term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease was stigmatizing because of the word alcohol and fatty. And this was not something that was acceptable to the majority of the population. The other factor was of course that NAFR comes with a lot of other metabolic risk factors. And when we talk about NAFR, we are missing out the, the emphasis on uh, presence of metabolic risk factors. And that's why now we term it as metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. And that's the full form of, uh, you know, mass health. To call anybody to have significant steatosis, you should have more than 5% of the hepatocytes which are laden with fat. So de by definition, you should have more than 5% of the liver that is steatotic. But in addition to that, you should have one cardiometabolic risk factors as outlined, either in elevated triglycerides, low HDL, presence of diabetes or prediabetes, obesity or a high blood pressure. So to qualify the term massive, you need to have steatosis and one of the metabolic risk factors. We are quite familiar with the typical Asian Indian phenotype and we are unique in our own way to say that we have presence of type 2 diabetes at a much younger age. We have a low threshold for BMI for presence of type 2 diabetes and we all know that we have a lot of central adiposity and a high amount of visceral fat which makes us more prone for development of non-communicable diseases as well as type 2 diabetes. We have a high amount of serum insulin levels in parallel to uh, insulin resistance and we have a rapid decline in the beta cell function and it may be argued that when you look at the clusters we are predominantly an insulin deficient population but we have equally amount of high incidences of insulin resistance that predominates very early in the course of life and then <clears throat> we have typical diabetic dyslipidemia low levels of adiponectin high levels of circulating inflammatory markers low muscle mass that's something we rarely talk about but we do have a high prevalence of sarcopenia and that's something we overlook very often when in our assessment so as a rule when we look at our patients and assess them it should be mandatory that you look at markers and you can do that simply in your own clinic when you assess the patient it's not very difficult you don't need very fancy tools to assess sarcopenia but it should be looked at and my emphasis is that we should be screening for NAFLD in our patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, this paper that was published in IGAM uh, outlines the fact that, as I said earlier, that we do see a lot of ultrasound reports which mention presence of grade 1 fatty liver. But are these to be looked at seriously or not? But anybody who comes to you with elevated liver transaminases, particularly ALT more than AST and a low platelet count are these are the patients who are going to develop you know clinically significant liver fibrosis so if you have a high BMI elevated liver transaminases and a low platelet count low platelet count should be always a kind of a, a flash in your mind that what is happening is the liver involved in any kind of a way because there's seldom very few conditions that will cause other than infections or hematological conditions, metabolic conditions that will cause a low platelet count. So anybody with a low platelet count and a high ALT, it should flash in your mind, does this patient have a chronic liver disease? And true enough, you'll find that presence of you know, clinically significant liver fibrosis. Just elevated liver transaminases are also possible in clinically significant liver fibrosis, but this happens in a very small population of people. Uh, important is that when you look at patients who are diabetic versus non-diabetic, why are we so concerned about diabetes? Because if you look at the mortality statistics as the patient moves on from just fatty liver disease to you know 
uh, liver fibrosis and uh, hepatocellular carcinomas, the mortality almost doubles up. And clearly you can see from the top graph where patients did not have diabetes and the low uh, sort of time course where patients have diabetes, you can see the doubling of statistics in terms of mortality till the patient as he moves from NAFL to NASH to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinomas and mortality. So patients without diabetes had a 43% mortality after hepatocellular carcinomas and look at patients with diabetes almost 85 percent. So there's a doubling of statistics that happen and that's why you need to screen your patients with diabetes very early so that you can have an opportunity to intervene and reverse the process early enough. This is also important that if you look at presentation of diabetes at any age group and this paper outlines that that if you have longer duration of diabetes at any age group, the liver related events go up as well as all cause mortality with the longer duration of diabetes in any of the age groups. So they looked at 40, 50, 60 and 70 years and the duration of diabetes and it was proportional to the duration of diabetes. Uh, commonly we always talk about muscled and liver disease. But what is important to understand is the most common cause of death is cardiovascular disease and not liver related events because there is a commonality of risk factors that you find which happens with the occurrence of you know cardiovascular disease so if you see the overlaps are very high and patients will not commonly die of liver related events they will commonly die more of cardiovascular disease and the association with cardiovascular disease is extremely strong and that's the reason why this is important that we not only deal with the fatty liver disease but the associated metabolic risk factors that the patient has got because to reduce the cardiovascular risk that the patient may have. Uh, so we boil down to the fact that how do we approach our patients and what should be our sort of a modality to screen and diagnose and when should it be done, how it should be done and why should we do it. And if you look at the CAP practices, that's knowledge, attitude and practice awareness, then this is a paper that looked at that how many people are really aware, one, that they have or they have a knowledge about fatty liver disease. And you can clearly see here uh, age-wise whether the doctor, has a doctor mentioned to you or have you heard about cirrhosis or which of these conditions you think can cause it. This was just a sort of survey that was done in 5,000 residents in New York and they found that there was a very low awareness about what fatty liver disease means and what are the associations of fatty liver disease or implications of fatty liver disease. So it is important for us to start conversations with our patients when you find that there are markers of fatty liver disease and you should be sort of just don't dismiss it off because we need to see that we identify our patients early and unless you educate your patients they are not going to sort of you know take seriousness about it all. Uh, this was another paper that looked at the cap for NAFL and this is the paper in 2023. It said that 72.8 percent of the people had heard of NAFL term but the knowledge about NAFL was low. So if you look at all the different pie diagrams at the bottom, whether it's awareness on progression to liver related complications in NAFL, awareness on progression to CVD in NAFL or recommendations for NAFL management in the form that doctor recommends or patient clinic visits after recommendation for NAFL. You find that in all this majority of the patients the answer was no and that's really alarming because almost 50 to 60 percent of the patients are not taking the presence of NAFL seriously. So it boils down to the fact that we need to be more emphatic that we need to talk about NAFL to our patients. It's just the fact that commonly when patients come to us with overweight and obesity our conversations about weight are seldom taking a back seat and that's not really good because we know that obesity and fatty liver disease parallel each other in terms of the incidence and that's true for all non-communicable diseases and very often we are not in the process of talking about the weight management we deal with the non-communicable diseases very easily and our conversation stops there so we need to have a more proactive approach
to talk about weight management because that is going to sort of help to reduce the incidence of all the other burden of non-communicable disease. So these are the recommendations that are there for screening. So any patient who comes to you with overweight or obesity, presence of type 2 diabetes, elevated liver enzymes with the presence of dysglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, low HDL or hypertension. These are all potential patients who should be screened for presence of fatty liver disease or steatotic liver disease. I should change that term. And the most common thing, uh, if you see in the reports, is always your liver transamine is an abdominal sonography. But what I recommend is it's the simplistic way that you do the FIB4 scores in a patient when they come to your clinical practice because you can do it across the table. It's just a calculation. And based on that, you can easily identify the patients who are at a low risk, indeterminate risk, and high risk. And I'm going to allude to this in a little while again. So FIB4 is basically a good way to estimate your risk profiling. And all it needs is the age, ALT, AST, and platelet count. And you can easily identify the patients who and the risk profile the patient that which are the patients who are going to need more aggressive treatment versus lesser sort of you know you can just keep them on a watch list as such and there is a clear relationship of FIF4 and the treatment outcomes that you can see so if you know that your FIF4 is increasing you need to have a more proactive approach to aggressively manage this patient to keep this patient as much as away from or <coughs> downstage the liver fibrosis as much as possible. And when you put an intervention in place and you see the FIF4 reducing, you know that the intervention is actually helping out. <clears throat> and we can clearly see the evidence that 10 year cumulative incidence of mortality as well as you know the outcomes that we can see in terms of CV events that are related to the FIF4. So if you see a high FIF4 is associated with 33 percent higher risk of cardiovascular events as compared to a low FIB4 score and as well as same thing happens with the all-cause mortality. Now if you have somebody who's in the indeterminate class or a high risk it is mandatory that you do the elastography which is easily available to us. Uh, so we generally patients who are in the intermediate class or in the high risk category would probably go for an elastography for determination of the staging of the liver fibrosis. And based on that, you can clearly see, so most of the fibrosis scores, you stage it from F0 to F4, and this go from less than 7 to more than 16. CAP scores can also be looked at, but it's not that easy. So looking at liver uh, stiffness median is much easier, me liver stiffness measurement is much easier than the CAP scores and that identifies the staging of the fibrosis that the patient has got. Now I have all this while talked to you about diagnosis and a little background about what steroidic liver disease is about. What is the therapeutic approach that we tend to have and clearly there is a multi-pronged approach that we can have in terms of lifestyle, diet, managing the comorbidities, pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery. This is an important slide that we've got that if you affect weight loss, what are the changes that you'll see in the liver and how much of this is sustainable at the end of one year. So if you can achieve a more than or equal to 3% weight loss, you can get steatosis improvement. If you have more than or equal to 5% weight loss, then you can sort of have ballooning and inflammation improvement, but only 30% sustain it at the end of one year. If you have more than or equal to 7% of weight loss, then you can get a NASH resolution, but only 18% are able to sustain the weight loss at the end of one year. And if you get more than 10%, then you can have a fibrosis regression, but only less than 10% are able to sustain the weight loss at the end of one year. Uh, this is the last part of my talk that we want to see that do we have effective uh, interventions and saroglitazar is one molecule that has been investigated extensively. Can I have your permission to use one more minute of my time please? Thank you. It's a dual PPAR agonist and we know that PPAR alpha is found in the liver, kidney, heart and muscle and is implicated in the uptake and oxidation of fatty acids and lipoprotein metabolism. PPAR gamma is mainly expressed in the adipose tissue with beneficial effects on glucose homeostasis by increasing the insulin sensitivity and glucose disposal and prevents the loss of beta cell mass. Uh, 
and together the effect sort of causes a reduction of triglycerides and it also reduces the insulin resistance and controls the blood sugar level. You have great evidence in the improvement of glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity index and this has been validated in a number of trials. One of them is seen over here. You've got a lot of other modalities of treatment that have been used in our clinical practice right from metformin to vitamin E. We have also used pioglitazone and that is great data and a lot of guidelines do recommend pioglitazone. You have obitocolic acid and I'm going to talk some of the newer molecules that are you know, being in, under investigations in my last slide as I come to it. There is evidence for study that looked at almost 104 patients and they looked at 1 milligram, 2 milligram and 4 milligram studied over 16 weeks and they found they looked at the change in the transaminase, absolute amount of liver fat content change, the percentage of patients that had a liver fat reduction by 10% and by 30%. And clearly the evidence came out strong in favor of syroglitazar as compared to placebo. You also, this was a biopsy driven study of NASH and this was a 60, 64 week study and they looked at that does it help in fibrosis reduction or worsening of fibrosis and again cytoglitazar came out in terms of benefit against placebo. This is of course a CAP study that the real world study that was done and again you find that this was a 52 week study they used uh, cytoglitazar 4 milligram and patients identified were NAFL with or without diabetes and elevated ALT with a liver stiffness measurement of more than or equal to 6 kilopascals and a CAP score of more than 290 and then they looked at with elastography and you find that there was a downgrading of the fibrosis that happened with sarcoplatisar. So in interest of time I'm going to end up by saying that a lot of guidelines are now recommending the use of sarcoplatisar particularly when you have presence of steroidic liver disease high triglyceride values these are the very patients and, and the elevated liver transaminases that they would benefit in terms of use of sarablitazar. These are some of the newer molecules, particularly great data with lanifibrinor, resmitron, and efroxamine. These have now phase three uh, development and they have shown to be very useful in terms of, but it will take time for any of these molecules to be really clinically available for us. So I want to end with my last slide. And this is a mnemonic where M stands for mast cell is metabolic or dysfunction associated uh, steatotic liver disease, which is redefined from NAFL. A is association of at least one cardiometabolic risk factors as outlined. S stands for screening and diagnostic tests like ultrasound, FIB4 index, and elastography, which are strongly recommended. L stands for lifestyle modification and weight reduction which should be the first line management but sustained weight reduction is a major challenge. Uh, D stands for of course drugs like saraglitazone which is an approved medication to treat NAFL with metabolic disorders in India which reduce liver enzyme, liver fat and fibrosis scores as well. Thank you very much for your patience.